you'll remain standing. Our first hymn will be number 340, Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy. song. If you'll join me in uh, our affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed, you can find it on the screens or in your bulletin or on page 881 in your hymnal. We have so many ways for you to participate in this service. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. It is good to be home, y'all. If you haven't followed my world travels, uh, I went down last week and, uh, and uh, had a memorial service for my uncle, Mark Jordan. And uh, I was thrilled to listen to Blair, uh, Reverend Blair's aunt, uh, as she uh, filled in for me, and I was so thankful that she brought the word that she did. It was such a good sermon, and uh, she has a presence, doesn't she? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I knew she would be a blessing for y'all. And uh, uh, from there, I went to uh, New Orleans and had a good anniversary trip with my wife. It was the first vacation we'd had in a long time without many rap. And so <laughs> we stayed away from Bourbon Street and had some good food and uh, listened to some good jazz. It was excellent. And uh, got back late last night from continuing ed. I'm just glad to be home, y'all. It, uh, it was a long trip. <laughs> I know y'all from probably identify with that. I want to draw your attention to our uh, flowers, which are found on page six. And the sanctuary flowers for this morning are to the glory of God and in honor of the 62nd wedding anniversary of Joanne and Walter Kane with love from their family. Congratulations, y'all. That's... That is impressive and something for, for me to shoot for, so. I don't know how you did it, Joanne. <laughs> I know, I got to see you in a few minutes. <laughs> Are there other announcements uh, that people might like to make this morning? Oh, I have one. Uh, United Women in Faith will have our annual district conference the last Saturday in October. It will be at Ben Hill. Breakfast will be served like at 9.30. If you're interested in going, uh, please shoot me a text or something and I'll send you the registration information. We're also collecting um, twin sheet sets, uh, towels, uh, and blankets uh, for the district to give to uh, women's shelters. That's the uh, United Women of Faith, the Central North District meeting and, uh, and collection. Uh, get with Lisa for that on details. Thank you, Lisa. Wayne, I'm assuming barbecue's coming. <laughs> this is the last time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is? You know what we want to our very place for they spend their anniversary. Thank you. They've been doing that for probably six to ten years. <laughs> God bless y'all. And they don't, they don't, they know that that weekend and they always do. So I think that's very special. Amen. If it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have a barbecue for all the years. If it wasn't for all the working together, we couldn't have it. So I know I make the same announcement every week, but we, the ladies, to do that Friday morning, we say around 10, and you can come on early if you want to, but we have to wait till the hens get done before we can do anything with them. So sometimes the time does vary, but come on. That was the barbecue this weekend, uh, October 20th through 21st. All hands on deck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for the ways that you serve. Anything else? Lisa. Children's Church is a huge success in this thing because we thank all the teachers and the walkers. And we needed one more teacher to finish out the month. And God has blessed us with Dana Stevens. So let's clap for her. Thank you. <laughs> so Children's Church is for kindergarten through fifth grade. And it's just going beautifully. So thank you. And thank you to all the teachers and the walkers. And especially to our two helpers, Isabel and Wizzy. Let's thank them, too. <laughs> amen, amen. We're thankful for 
all the things that, uh, that happen for our children and, and all the help that goes into that, the ways that you serve uh, the, those who are so young and formable and, uh, and malleable. Uh, we're so thankful for y'all. Any other announcements? We have a... Yes. Thank you, Shelby. That's uh, Family Fun Night, 5 o'clock, Sunday, October 29th. And I think the dessert theme is vanilla. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the chili theme. So if you can work that into your, ch please don't yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, that's a, that could be some funky chili. <laughs> uh, I, I think I remember Jonathan Love saying something about don't bring, just bring vanilla ice cream. Huh? He's got some some particulars that he wants y'all to do, so <laughs> I can say that because he's not here. Uh, pr uh, on that note, pray for Jonathan. He's got a cold and, uh, and the love family. Uh, I wanted to highlight that our uh, cluster charge conference will take place on uh, this Thursday, October 19th at 7 p.m. The, the Zoom registration link has been sent out in your newsletters. If you haven't registered for that, go ahead and do that. They'll send out a, a link for y'all to, uh, to come in. We need six folks from the church uh, to vote. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily care who it is, but you, sh you should come anyway and see what goes on in these charge conferences. It's a, it's a hoot. <laughs> and uh, on that note, uh, let's transition to uh, prayer joys and concerns. Uh, are there any prayer requests that y'all have? Andy. Diane Dimmick. Yes, Diane Dimmick. Kathy Gilbert. Odell Horn. Odell Horn. Yeah. Tony Carroll. And Tony Carroll. Yeah. I'd like to pray for Bingo as well. Yes. <laughs> well, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> On October the 6th, uh, 2 28 in the afternoon, Valerie Jean Glenn, uh, seven pounds, three ounces, 20 and a half inches long. And she has a little bit of hair. <laughs> Congrats to the Bartons and uh, to their uh, young family. Marsha. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. We've been praying for you, Willie, and we're so glad to see you in worship this morning. Yeah. Brian. I think that's a pretty good name, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Praise for uh, Miss Dot's granddaughter. Anyone else? Michael? The Murphy and Bell family. Catherine Hall, yes, absolutely. And Billy Simpson. And Billy Simpson. Bernadine. The Jackson family. The Jackson family, yeah. Yeah. 
there are no others, let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, help us. We're a messy people with messy lives. We ask that you would give us the strength that we need to help clean those messes and help us with your power to make the make new the spots that we cannot get to or reach. Where there is sickness and illness and pain, we ask that you would heal, not by making everything what it used to be, because it can't be, but by helping us to heal and deal with the scars of our new realities. Where there is suffering and grieving and tears, be there for us to let us know your presence will never, ever leave us. That there is nowhere for us to hide from you, and even if we could, why would we want to? You alone, O oh Lord, understand all things and can supply the peace that surpasses all understanding. Oh God, help us. We pray this morning for a world that is also messy, for Israelis, for Palestinians, for Israel in Gaza and the West Bank. We pray for the families affected by the loss of life. We pray for peace where none really seems possible, Lord. We pray for a, a two-state solution even when it seems like that's no longer possible. We watch the news, oh God, and we just wonder what the solution might be to these problems in a land we have long called holy. It's because we've seen your action and your plan unfold in those places. And so we ask, O oh Lord, will you please unfold your plan there once again? We pray for minimal harm to be done, even as we expect others to prevent that prayer from being answered with a yes. We pray for an end to human rights violations. We pray for an end to violence. Help us to advocate for the flourishing of all life for all humans everywhere and to resist wearing jerseys in a cruel competition for abundant life where there can only be some who flourish. And we know, oh God, that this end of violence will only come when we allow your peace, your shalom, to direct our own individual lives in our life as a church body. It must start with us. And so we join the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Equip us to bring about the change that we want to see. We pray all these things and more in the name of Christ who intercedes for us and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. rise in body or in spirit uh, for our next hymn, which is There is a Wideness in God's Mercy. It's number 121 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Uh, the, the words will be on the screen.
Please be seated. I invite our ushers to come forward this time. Walter, be nice to me. <laughs> As we prepare our hearts for offer to, uh, offering our gifts back to God, uh, God has been gracious to us all distributing to us the gift of, of grace as God sees fit and equally. So then let us return our gifts, God's tithes and our offerings with an attitude of thankfulness for the grace that we receive day by day. Let us pray. God of endless patience, we know that the sound of our complaining is not the music that pleases your ears. We complain about the food that is under or overcooked, and you hear the stomachs that have no food. We whine about the bed being too soft or too hard, and you instead see those whose bed is the sidewalk or the floor of a cell. May the offering we bring today be an act of praise that drowns out the noise of our complaining. May it find its way to bring comfort to your children who have little or nothing. And when that happens, may it be joy for your eyes and ears and for ours. In Christ we pray. Amen. remain standing in body or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. It's the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And this was lectionary a couple of weeks ago. Hear the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers, the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon about, and about three o'clock, he did the same. 
And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, Why are... Oh, I missed that part. You also go. That's what he said. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage, a denarian. Now when they first came, they thought, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage, a denarian. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And now at this time, the children will come forward for a time with Carol, the children's message. this morning. Did y'all see we asked some, I asked some special people to come help me this morning. They are very, very excited about being down here. But that's what happens when you're their favorite Aunt Carol. So tell me, do you like doing chores? No. No. Okay. Me either. I do not like doing chores myself. Okay, but what if you get paid for it? Does that help if you get some money? Yeah. You only what? You got lots of money. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I need to hire you. Okay, I'm going to hire you this morning for three minutes of work. Okay. And so um, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you for your three minutes of work. Sounds like a sweet deal, right? So, Fisher, I need you to start, and if you'll just get one book at a time. I know you could carry all 15. One book at a time. Wait, Fisher, and then I want you to take it way over here, okay? And we'll be back with you in a minute. One, uh-uh, one at a time. One at a time. Okay, and so <laughs> did y'all have a good week? Did everybody have a good week? You did have a good week, okay. And um, did you have fun at school? Fisher, if you could go a little faster. And... Um, so you had fun at school? No, you didn't have fun at school? I had fun at school. Okay, you did. Um, Lizzie, would you go help Fisher just one book at a time, please? Okay, thank you. And so did you do anything special yesterday? I decorated for Halloween yesterday. You, oh, with balloons? You went to, oh, that sounds like fun. Belle, would you go help them, please? Okay, thank you. And um, what about, um, do you have a pumpkin on your porch? You have pumpkins at home? Oh, goodness, it's taking forever, isn't it? Okay. Um, you didn't? Okay. Okay, um, Dagny, will you go help move the books, please? Okay, thank you. Okay, it's just you and me. You want to just sit by? We'll just talk about, what about school? Do you have school tomorrow? You do? Fisher, how are you doing? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, still got a few more books to go. They've been working hard, haven't they? 
I know, keep going, keep going. Everybody's got to keep going. So I put up some twinkling lights on my door yesterday, and they are so spooky looking. They are so spooky. Okay, let's see. Hmm. All right, Devante, will you go get the last hymnal? Okay, now if everybody will come sit back down. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you for carrying that last hymnal. Okay, so listen, I really do have some money for you. Uh-huh, I do. So, um, Devontae, come here. You carried one hymnal, right? Okay, so you get 50 cents, okay? And, Dagna, you probably carried about five. You get 50 cents. Oh, good, good for the book fair. There we go. And then, Isabel, you might have carried about eight. You get 50 cents. And Lizzie, I noticed you probably carried about 12. You get 50 cents. And Fisher, how many did you have to carry? You get 50 cents. Now, do you think that's fair? No. <laughs> Why is that not fair? I did give you the same number of money, but did you do the same amount of work? You did not, and that was the scripture that Pastor Chris read to us, that this is just like what happens in the kingdom of God, that we don't get what we deserve. We get so much more. We don't want to get what we deserve. Because the wages of sin is death, and we that would be bad for us. But God loves us so much that he does not give us what we deserve. And when Jonah was a little 16-year-old boy, that's my son, and he would go speeding, and he got a few tickets for speeding. And you know what we would say? Because Mr. Norman and I had to go to court a few times with Jonah. And we would say that we didn't want justice. We wanted mercy. And that is what God gives us. He doesn't give us justice. He gives us mercy. And for that, we are very, very thankful. Okay? So let's pray together. You ready? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for letting us be here. And we thank you for not giving us what we deserve, for giving us all of your blessings and for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Carol. As the <laughs> children are going back to their seats, stand up and greet your neighbor and pass the peace of Christ to them and say, Jesus loves you. <laughs>
Tiana, uh, my phone is not connecting to my computer, so if you wouldn't mind, I'll just give you some keys and let you hit the next. Good to be back. Good to be again. Uh, I, I know I said that already, but I'm glad to be preaching God's word this morning. I had a, a church member uh, one time. And I'm not going to tell on them. <laughs> Who absolutely had a, an issue with Jesus and this story that I read earlier. At least he was honest about his problems with Jesus. Most of us are often not honest with ourselves when we hear a word that is a hard word from God. Uh, and have some difficulties taking it to heart and putting it into practice. Maybe that's the best way to say that. I might say when we hear a piece of scripture that offends our sensibilities and our preconceived notions of who Jesus is and who we are. 
I might have told this story before, and if I have, forgive me, but uh, Cassie one time was preaching an excellent sermon on uh, the Good Samaritan, uh, the parable of the man who helped the man who was beaten and robbed and left for dead. And after the sermon, which told exactly who our neighbors are, which is everywhere, <coughs> everyone, all the time, a man came up to Cassie and asked her, so really, who is our neighbor? And the story just didn't sit well with him because he was looking for any loophole he could find to prevent him from helping someone he didn't want to help, someone he was uncomfortable helping. Sometimes it's like that, y'all. Sometimes... We just don't want to act like we ought to, think like we ought to, believe like we ought to. And how we ought to be and think and act and believe is how Jesus taught us. I confess that sometimes I have problems blessing my enemies and praying for those who persecute me. Maybe you do too. Sometimes I have problems passing on the grace that I've been given. Not because I don't want to. My brain says yes. This church member of mine had problems believing that everyone was a sinner in the sight of God and that anyone, anywhere, at any time can receive divine grace. That there are no I've been flying a lot, y'all, that there are no first class or business premium or comfort plus tiers on Grace Airlines. You see, this church member had accumulated what they thought was the diamond medallion tier of church membership. I'm a Delta flyer, y'all. <laughs> They'd done the work of the church for a long time, and they thought that they had certain privilege. I know that's a loaded word, but that's really what it was, right? They had the privilege to have primary say in how the church operates and what the church's mission is and who was in and who was out. They had problems with a God who would give the same reward of grace to the ones who had been a member of the church for a week and to the ones who had been a member of the church for 2,080 weeks. That's 40 years. Good round number, biblical. Tiana, if you'll do the next slide, thank you. Maybe you're like my old church member. Maybe when you heard this parable, it didn't sit well with you. And I'd say to you that there are cultural reasons why it did, did not sit well with you. Uh, be comforted that it didn't sit well with the people who heard it first either. Many of us sitting in this church, maybe most of us, have invested a lot of work in the universal church and not just particular local church, but often in this local church, right? We've been laboring for quite a while, many of us. We look at others who are recent converts to Christianity and we're legitimately thankful that they found Jesus. But then we might wonder to ourselves, well, how are they ever going to measure up to the work that we've done here? How are they going to fit into our community? And what gives them the right to think that their voice carries the same weight as mine at administrative council meetings? Ooh, it's okay to say ouch. After all, some of the families of the folks sitting here in these pews built this church. Some have family members buried in the cemetery from a long time ago. Some have taught Sunday school for years and years. Some have given significantly to a number of important and vital causes to this church over the years, whether it's the mission of the church or the support of the building that supports the mission. Ought not the ones who have supported it longer receive a little bit more of God's favor? Shouldn't it be the case that the more we give to God, the more blessing and favor we receive? 
the honor now. Thank you. Sorry, my phone's a mess. Here's the, the, the key thing that we miss if we run headfirst into the trap of thinking as the world thinks. Y'all, grace is the unmerited favor of God. God's economy and politics are not capitalism. And this is sometimes hard for me because capitalism works really well on me. Uh, you should see me when there's a good commercial. <laughs> Two days later, I'll tell Cassie that I'm thinking about buying a new sink because I saw that coal commercial and it was incredible, the things that they do with sinks now. <laughs> God's politics are not meritocracy. In other words, you can't earn your way into God's kingdom. It's not socialism or communism either. God gives how God desires. This is a theocracy. And there's nothing that we can do to earn the grace that God gives. That means that, although God does appreciate the work that we do in this mission field, in the kingdom, in the vineyard, and the fruit that we bring about for that kingdom, that work does not mean that we get a bigger reward than those who bear less fruit. Because the reward is the same no matter how good our abilities are, no matter how long our time of service is. In fact, when we begin to think about the way the way that the boss operates in our story, And the way that he pays for the work, God's way of working becomes even more clear to us. Can't you just see those workers lining up to be paid? I think Carol did a great job of that. I almost don't have to preach. The boss starts at the left side of the line, his right, the manager in the story. And he starts to pay those who have been working the least amount of time, those who came at 5 p.m. The way that these folks were hired implies that their abilities are not quite the same as the ones who were picked for, to work first, the all-day laborers. Maybe they could only work one hour because they lacked much physical strength. Or maybe they only had one leg or one foot. Or maybe they never worked a vineyard before and needed training. But usually the good laborers were picked first because the ones hiring day laborers knew what they were doing when they hired the workers. They know what to look for. Maybe they know who has typically done the best work for them in the past or a friend's uh, field and got recommendations from them. And so these strong, good, whole day workers look down the line and are surprised to see that the boss is paying hour long workers day wages. If I were a whole day worker, I would probably look down that line, see what they received and think, oh, yes, I'm getting more today. If they're getting what I was promised initially, then I might get eight or 12 days worth of wages. We're going to eat well tonight. We're going to the Sizzler, y'all. <laughs> Whatever the Middle East uh, equivalent of that is. But then somebody who worked two hours gets paid one day's worth of wages. And then somebody who works four hours is paid the same as the ones who worked one hour, and then my blood pressure would start to rise, y'all, <laughs> because I'm a capitalist, until they got to me. And by the time the boss reached me, steam would have been coming out of my ears as the boss paid me what I was promised. 
Jesus says that the whole day workers grumbled, saying, those who were hired last worked one hour, and they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work all day in the hot sun. But the field boss replies, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I give to you. And don't I have the right? Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I'm generous? The Greek there is even more telling. I love this. Uh, this is my favorite part of the whole entire parable. The Greek actually reads, Or is your eye evil? Because I am good. Whew. Isn't that something? Those idioms really have a way of striking at you. That's the entire sermon, y'all. Sometimes God's goodness makes us jealous around those of us who also receive a blessing. Because we think that we, ourselves, I, am all that and a bag of chips, as the kids used to say in my day. Because we can do no wrong. Mm. This is called cognitive bias. When good things happen to others, we find a way to say, well, they didn't actually deserve it. They got it because of nepotism or because they knew somebody. Or but when the same thing that happens to someone else happens to us, we deserved it, right? I was listening to someone talk about uh, artificial intelligence this week. And there was a, a creator of artificial intelligence and who, was, uh, who was saying, who was asked the question, how will you know that artificial intelligence can be evil? And they answered, when it, develops, when it develops cognitive bias. When it says that others don't deserve something good, but it deserves something good. That struck me. And even if we're all of these things, if we're all that in a bag of chips, if we're good and strong workers and good workers, and there are, many of us sitting here are really great workers. Jesus' point here is that the first will be last, and the last will be first. When the last are given equal payment to the first, it feels like the first rights are being taken away from them. Forget equity, which is the idea that some should be given help so that they can achieve an equal result to those who don't need as much help. Forget that. We often don't even want equality. That's a hard truth. But that's not how Jesus understands this. Jesus knows how we'll react to the parable, and yet he tells it anyway. God's grace is not fair. It's just absolutely unfair. And praise be to God that it isn't fair because if I'm honest with myself, I've received much more grace than I deserve. What's fair for me is far less than what has already been given to me. I've received grace upon grace, and I deserve none of it. And the same goes for you. Even if you haven't personally tasted the goodness of the Lord's salvation through professing faith in Jesus Christ, which I think most of us have here, even those who have not received that salvation have received God's prevenient grace the grace that is given universally to every single human being on earth, the grace that comes before we're even aware of our need for God. And we get that grace because God is that good and that loving. We get to taste and to see the goodness of God well before we even know there is a good God. But lest we get two big heads, 
very few of us, and I want you to hear me say this to you and to me, very few of us here are actually the earliest workers. Trying to be as pastoral as I can. Many of us have done a lot for the kingdom of God. And yet there are those like St. Teresa of Calcutta or St. Martin of Birmingham or St. Francis of Assisi or St. Peter of Galilee or St. Paul of Tarsus who have literally given all of themselves, resulting in their deaths to the work of the kingdom. And this isn't a guilt trip, y'all. This is not a guilt trip. Those who have given up everything in this world to be able to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, though, are those all-day laborers. It's not a guilt trip to make you feel like you don't measure up to those all-day laborers because they receive the same grace that you receive. This is just to say that there are those workers in the kingdom who have done much more than we have and who will attain the same measure of grace. And if you think that when we get to heaven and we meet Jesus and we receive that final payment of grace, that these saints, these all-day laborers, are going to look at what we receive with a sour face, you're out of your mind. I'd love to talk with you more then about the idea that grace like divine love is not pie. It's not some key lime cake at our covered dish meals that you have to get early before we run out of it. Those saints and all of us here will look on our reward and be thrilled to see those receive the same reward that we have received. I guarantee it. And so here is the takeaway. Perhaps we ought to live like this is true. Perhaps we ought to live like it's true that anyone who receives justifying and sanctifying grace receives it in the same measure. If the playing field of eternal life within the kingdom of God is level, which it is, that leads no room for attitudes of superiority within the body of Christ, for levels of Christianity that are somehow higher or lower or better, more worthy. Since grace is not fair, perhaps we ought to also be unfair when we pass on the grace that we have received. To give maybe the same measure of grace to the stranger, the foreigner, the visitor who doesn't look or think anything like we do as we give to our friends and our loved ones, our family. That's hard. This parable isn't given to us just so that we can learn what God's like. None of them are. That's a big part of it. But the other part is to go and be like God. We might be like God in our living and our distribution of grace of our own variety, ever pointing to the one who equips us to live lives of grace. So may God help us to be such a people who are generous, who don't get evil eyes just because God is good, to live graciously so that we might cause others to wonder why it is that we act the same toward everyone. And then when they wonder why and how we can do this, May we testify to the one who has given us this unfair, wildly radical, uncomfortable, unyielding grace. In the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen. I'll announce the last hymn. If you'll rise in body or in spirit and sing Give Thanks, our, our final hymn. It comes from the faith we sing, that small little black hymnal. Uh, number 2036. Uh, we're not doing holy <laughs>
receive now this benediction. And before I give the benediction, sorry about the words on the screen. Uh, don't know what happened. I, I think it must not have saved. I don't know. But we sang it. It was a beautiful song. I love that song, Andy. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? We're supposed to go into the world and to give thanks and to testify to the God who has given us abundantly life and grace and goodness. And then after we've given thanks to go and pass it on. Go and do that this week, now and always. In the name of the God, or the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Go in peace. Amen. Oh, I need you.